Hey everyone! Just when you thought the twists in Egghead Island couldn't get any more intense, Oda throws us another curveball. And yes, you heard it right, someone else is joining the fray. You might be thinking, seriously? Another big reveal? And honestly, I'm right there with you. Now, most bets are on the Blackbeard Pirates making their grand entrance, but hold on. I've got a different theory about who this unexpected guest might be. I'll get to that juicy detail soon, but first let's talk about Saint Saturn and Kazaru's strategic decision to stay on Egghead Island during the Buster Call. It's a game changer, folks, and here's why. Let's dive deeper into the genius of Saturn's strategy. You see, both Saint Saturn and Kazaru are pretty much invulnerable to a Buster Call, so their decision to stay isn't just bold, it's brilliantly tactical. But here's where Saturn really shines as a villain. Unlike the typical set it and forget it bad guys, Saturn isn't just sitting back and hoping for the best. He's fully aware that his plan might not go as smoothly as expected. This level of cautious cunning? It's making me respect him more with every chapter. It's not just about the power play here. It's the acknowledgement of potential failure that sets Saturn apart. Saturn is changing the game by deciding to personally oversee the operation. This isn't your typical hit-and-run villain strategy. Think of it as Batman-level smart, but with better decision-making skills. Remember Crocodile and Alabasta? He had multiple chances to finish off Luffy, whether it was with his hook, burying him in quicksand, or draining his life fluids. Each time, Crocodile walked away too soon, missing the crucial moment when Luffy revived. Saturn, on the other hand, is not taking any chances. He's there to ensure the job is done, learning from past villains' mistakes. Saturn's approach is a refreshing change from the usual villain trope. Unlike Crocodile, who seemed almost incapable of following through with his plans, Saturn is the opposite. This difference is thrilling because it hints at a real possibility of Saturn facing defeat. And imagine the irony if part of his downfall is caused by the buster call he ordered. Now, about Kizaru. Let's be frank. His portrayal in this chapter is underwhelming. There's a particular panel that speaks volumes, and I bet you know exactly which one I'm talking about. In this chapter, we see a side of Kizaru that's shockingly different from his usual demeanor. It's arguably the most subdued moment for any marine admiral in the series. Picture this. Kizaru, with an expression like a chastised dog, a mix of guilt and helplessness in his eyes. It's a scene of pure, unadulterated shame. This depiction even surpasses Green Bull's retreat from Shanks, which, by comparison, was a calculated decision. Kizaru's moment, in contrast, feels like a betrayal of his own sense of justice and morality. Let's delve into the salary man theory that one of my commenters brought up, which brilliantly encapsulates the personas of the original marine admirals. It's a compelling metaphor for their roles and evolutions. Aokiji is like the salary man who, fed up with the system, walks away. Akainu embodies the one who immerses himself completely in the corporate ethos, climbing the ladder relentlessly. And Kizaru? He represents the salary man worn down by years of service, losing his individuality to the grind. This chapter shows Kizaru embodying this archetype to a T, a man so consumed by his role that he appears broken, a shadow of the individual he once was. Kizaru, in this moment, becomes a vivid representation of a soulless tool in the hands of the world government, echoing the tragic fate of Bartholomew Kuma. It's a striking metaphor for the loss of will and identity. And yet, ironically, even Kuma in his hollow state seems to possess more willpower than Kizaru now. It's not anger that this evokes in me, but a deep sense of disappointment. There's a certain resignation in choosing the wrong path for personal gain, but Kizaru? He's trapped, acting against his own desires, gaining nothing. It's a bleak portrayal of a man who's lost his way. Kizaru's inability to make decisions for himself is starkly evident, and it might just explain why we've barely seen him exhibit strong hockey skills. Hockey, being a manifestation of willpower, requires a certain inner strength and resolve. Kizaru, with his diminished will, might struggle to harness it effectively. The idea that he could use Conqueror's Haki seems far-fetched given his current submissive attitude. Interestingly, no admiral, not even Sakazuki, has been confirmed as a Conqueror's Haki user so far. I seem to have drifted into a Kizaru-focused discussion, but it's hard not to when faced with such a drastic character shift. His portrayal in this chapter was unexpectedly meek, a surprising twist for someone of his rank. But don't get me wrong, I'm not against adding layers to a character. In fact, I welcome it. The added depth to Kizaru's character is intriguing, albeit a bit saddening. It's difficult to watch someone who knows the system is flawed, yet feels too intimidated to challenge it. 
especially when their inaction causes harm to others. In a stark contrast to Kizaru's indecision, we witness a heart-wrenching scene involving Vegapunk. There's this haunting panel where he's alone, watching the destruction of Egghead Island, his life's work crumbling around him. The silence in this panel speaks volumes more than any dialogue could. It's a poignant moment, underscoring why Saturn hasn't eliminated Vegapunk yet. Logically, there's no reason for Vegapunk to still be alive. He's vulnerable, at the mercy of Saturn and Kizaru, both capable of ending him effortlessly. Yet, he remains, a testament to the complexities and moral ambiguities in this narrative. Saturn's actions take a darker turn in his dealings with Vegapunk. It seems that Saturn is deriving a twisted satisfaction from Vegapunk's despair. Saturn isn't just after Vegapunk's life, he wants to shatter his spirit. By allowing Vegapunk to witness the annihilation of his life's work and the potential loss of Bonnie and the others, Saturn is ensuring that Vegapunk feels the full weight of his defeat. It's only after Vegapunk has lost everything that Saturn plans to allow him the release of death. This is a haunting portrayal of Saturn's cruel nature. Saturn's approach to victory is not just about efficiency, it's steeped in a desire to inflict maximum pain and suffering. This is exemplified in the chapter's climax, where his glee is palpable at the prospect of Bonnie facing a tragic fate at the hands of a pacifista. Saturn's strategy is not just about the act of defeating his targets. It involves crafting scenarios that are as psychologically devastating as they are physically destructive. His tactics go beyond mere victory. They venture into the realm of sadistic triumph. Saturn's role in the story elevates him to a new level of villainy, perfectly fitting for the final saga of One Piece. His complexity as an antagonist lies not just in his power, but in his cruel, sadistic approach. This makes him a true pinnacle villain. His enjoyment of cruelty while keeping Vegapunk alive adds an interesting layer to the narrative and hints at potential consequences for Saturn's actions. The panel of Vegapunk watching Egghead's destruction parallels a poignant moment from Robin's flashback, where she, along with Olvia, Saul, and Professor Clover, witnesses the Tree of Knowledge burning. This comparison deepens the emotional impact of the scene, drawing a line between past and present tragedies in the One Piece world. The situation with Vegapunk mirrors the tragedy of the scholars in Robin's flashback, where their primary concern was the preservation of knowledge for future generations, rather than their own lives. This selfless dedication to their work reflects Vegapunk's current predicament. He's grappling with the possibility that his dream of creating a utopia may never be realized. The parallel with Ohara suggests a grim fate, as both Clover and Olvia faced their end amid the collapse of the Tree of Knowledge. This historical echo adds a layer of foreboding to Vegapunk's situation, intensifying the emotional stakes of the narrative. The scholars of Ohara in their final moments were singularly focused on ensuring their wealth of knowledge would survive for future generations. Their selflessness is mirrored in Vegapunk's current plight. Faced with the potential destruction of his life's work, Vegapunk, like the scholars, seems more concerned with the preservation of his research than his own survival. This reflection on the past tragedy of Ohara suggests Vegapunk may also make the ultimate sacrifice, ensuring that the essence of his work on Egghead Island lives on. While it was long assumed that Saul perished, the ambiguity around the deaths of Clover and Olvia, especially considering Olvia's absence in Robin's life, adds a layer of mystery and tragedy to the narrative. In this pivotal moment, Vegapunk's fate hangs in the balance, and the cost of his dedication to his work could very well be his own life. This scenario presents a stark contrast to the tragedy of O'Hara, suggesting Egghead Island could represent an alternate path where tragedy is averted. However, the uncertainty looms large, and optimism is hard to come by, especially considering the typically grim outcomes in such scenarios. Yet, with Luffy involved, there's always a glimmer of hope for a positive resolution. As for Luffy's own storyline, it frustratingly leaves us with more questions than answers, adding another layer of intrigue and suspense to the narrative. In the latest twist, the Marines discover Luffy indulging himself at one of the food replicators. This raises a compelling question. Who facilitated this feast for Luffy? It seems unlikely that Luffy, in his current state, made the decision to move there himself. Considering his weakened condition, someone else must be orchestrating these events. With Kizaru now definitively out of the picture as a potential helper, the mystery deepens about who's really aiding Luffy in his time of need. The theories surrounding Luffy's mysterious benefactor are intriguing. Many speculated about the possibility of light-speed food delivery, possibly hinting at Kizaru, but he's now out of the equation. Atlas also seems unlikely. 
Her previous inability to move and current preoccupation with Kuma make her an improbable candidate. This leads us to a more plausible suspect, Caribou. He's often mentioned jokingly, but as the situation unfolds, he emerges as a reasonable suspect. The chapter also updates us on the activities of the Straw Hat crew, further narrowing down the list of potential helpers for Luffy. The ongoing mystery of who's aiding Luffy continues to perplex. The scenario with Zoro battling Luchi and Jinbei's humorous navigation duties for Zoro adds to the chaos. Yet, amidst this, we see Caribou as a likely candidate for Luffy's secret helper. His awareness of Luffy's reliance on food, along with his own desperate need to escape the island, positions him as a key player. Additionally, his devil fruit ability allows for stealthy movements, making him a prime suspect. The theory is further supported by a panel where Caribou could potentially be hiding, unnoticed by the Marines. The narrative's repeated teasing of this mystery over multiple chapters has certainly heightened reader anticipation for a resolution. The conclusion of the chapter introduces new players whose identity is the subject of much speculation. The Blackbeard Pirates are a likely guess, especially considering their ship's earlier appearance near Egghead. However, the timeline poses questions. The destroyed marine ship, sent after the evacuated citizens, suggests these new arrivals could be at a considerable distance from Egghead, and it's unclear exactly when we're seeing the marine ship's destruction. This ambiguity adds to the excitement and speculation about who these new players might be and their role in the unfolding events. The chapter's conclusion, with the impending arrival of new players, raises the stakes significantly. Their proximity and timing are crucial, especially considering the imminent destruction of the island. This sense of urgency is compounded by multiple life-threatening challenges facing the characters. Among these is the situation with Brooke and Lilith, a pairing that adds a dynamic and entertaining element to the story. Brooke's interactions with characters who are as eccentric or more so than him always bring a unique energy to the narrative, highlighting his ability to adapt and thrive in chaotic situations. Brooke's versatility and value to the crew are highlighted once again in this chapter. His unique abilities enable him to create a frozen path for the Thousand Sunny, showcasing his resourcefulness. However, Brooke and Lilith are now facing a critical problem. They can't stop the ship, which is at risk of falling off the clouds and down to the main island, directly into the path of the Buster Call. This situation, coupled with Luffy being incapacitated and surrounded by Marines, creates intense suspense and urgency in the narrative. The situation in the chapter is reaching a critical point with three major crises unfolding simultaneously. The unique perspective shot of characters falling after being cut out of the vacuum rocket by Kizaru adds a layer of intensity. They face a double threat, being targeted by pacifistas and the danger of the fall itself. This dire scenario calls for immediate resolution. Additionally, the panel subtly reveals Kuma's lingering ability to act as he appears to protect Bonnie, suggesting he's not entirely incapacitated. However, the arrival of new players, possibly the Blackbeard Pirates, raises questions about their potential involvement or assistance in these critical situations. The current predicament in the chapter is indeed complex. The idea that the Blackbeard Pirates would intervene seems unlikely given their history and motives. They're more likely to relish the downfall of another Emperor of the Sea rather than assist. Sanji, positioned below the falling group, could potentially use his Skywalk ability, but the challenge is the size of those falling. Frankie, Atlas, and Kuma are significantly large, and Sanji might not be able to support all of them. This leads to a fascinating, though improbable, speculation. Could this be the moment for the Straw Hat Grand Fleet to make an appearance? Their sheer numbers could be a game-changer in creating enough chaos for an escape, especially against a fleet of a hundred marine ships. The Grand Fleet's potential arrival could be a game-changer. Their numbers are enough to form teams, each tackling a different crisis. Picture Bartolomeo creating a barrier to safely guide the Sunny, while Hakuba swiftly deals with the marines surrounding Luffy. However, I'm hesitant to fully commit to this idea. It doesn't seem to perfectly align with the current arc's theme, though considering the narrator's hint of an incident of historic proportions linked to the Egghead incident, their arrival could be the shocker we didn't see coming. Imagine the implications. An Elder Star or a Marine Admiral defeated or even the tragic demise of Vega Punk. Now that would send ripples across the world. The key question is, why would the Grand Fleet mobilize now and how could they gather so quickly? The news of Luffy taking Egghead Island and the impending siege might have been a catalyst. Unlike Wano, 
they're aware of the situation and could respond. However, the logistics are tricky. They'd need to converge on Egghead within a remarkably short time frame. Harudin's proximity on Elbaf makes him a plausible candidate, but the whereabouts of the rest are uncertain. Another potential solution to our cascading problems could be the Iron Giant. This colossal entity might be capable of saving the falling characters or deterring the Marines from Luffy. The dilemma now is choosing which problem the Iron Giant can address, as it's unlikely it can solve all three simultaneously. Additionally, there's speculation about the Revolutionary Army's involvement. They would fit the theme better, considering the focus on Kuma. However, this theory seems implausible. The key point here is Kuma's recent arrival via his teleportation powers, which he presumably would have used earlier if the Revolutionary Army was involved. This leaves us with the question of who can intervene effectively in this rapidly escalating situation. The idea of the Revolutionary Army arriving faster than Kuma seems far-fetched, considering the need to cross the Red Line. Moreover, the last glimpses we had of Dragon and his crew did not suggest any immediate plans for action. Morley's casual demeanor in the background further implies a lack of urgency for battle preparations. This raises doubts about the Revolutionary Army's capability or intention to intervene in the Egghead Island crisis. All right, folks, it's your turn to weigh in. Who do you think is about to shake things up on Egghead Island? And perhaps even more thrilling, will Oda reveal these mysterious arrivals in the next chapter? Or are we in for a suspenseful wait, as he often loves to do with his cliffhangers? Make sure you don't miss out on any updates. Hit that subscribe button for a steady dose of One Piece content delivered right to your YouTube feed. Your thoughts, theories, and discussions are what make this community great, so drop your comments below and let's keep the conversation going. I truly hope you have enjoyed this thrilling adventure into One Piece Chapter 1105. If you want to keep our adventure going, click on the video on your screen, right here, right now.